Okay. Good afternoon for our Korean participants. Good morning for the Swiss audience. Uh, very happy to welcome you to the Sustainable FinTech in Switzerland webinar. It will be approximately one hour. It will be recorded so you can listen to it on YouTube. And we have three speakers whom I'm going to introduce as they will present. And you can ask questions after each presentation, each speaker through the chat function so you don't have to wait until the end my colleague michael will keep track of these questions via the chat function in case i overlook something and uh, my colleague milena is at the cockpit for the technical issues she will supervise the whole thing we agreed that we would be on a first name basis for this webinar afterwards we can be doctor professor whatever is in uh, daily life but we i'm mark for you we have Thomas from University of Zurich, Yu Shin from FinTech Center Korea, and uh, Ronnie from uh, Florip Lawyers. So, what is sustainable FinTech? Uh, what does it mean? Our first speaker will give you some details, but I think we can already agree that uh, sustainable FinTech would mean something like it is here to stay. People can trust it. It has a uh, enduring a uh, lasting business model and it is here to make fee people feel secure so only if sustainability leads to stability and reliability can it live up to the reputation that switzerland has worldwide and only if there is stability trust reliability the traditional swiss value only then can also companies coming here from abroad benefit from the swiss branding by saying we are a Swiss company, uh, it's implied that they are trustworthy. So in that sense, I understand very intuitively a sustainable fintech, but we'll hear more about it. Last year, end of year 2019, we had between 300 and 400 fintech companies in Switzerland, depending on how you define it. And uh, two thirds of it were in Greater Zurich region, the region we promote as a business location. Fintech has been flourishing in the past few years and growing quickly because on the one hand of the financial sector, traditional financial sector, I'm thinking of the Forbes 500 uh, companies, UBS and Credit Suisse, but also of Korean Re, the reinsurance company, which has been here for two years now. So Fintech is flourishing because of the financial sector, which in turn is enabled by the IT sector, which is also very important. And behind all this uh, important part also play the top universities that we have, one of them being University Zurich with the Swiss FinTech Innovation Lab, founded and headed by Thomas Puschmann, our first speaker. Thomas has been engaged in digitization of financial services for 12 years now in various functions and positions at universities in Switzerland, St. Gallen and Zurich, where he's now, in Leipzig, Germany, but also at MIT and Stanford in the US. We are actually lucky to have him here in Zurich again, because he was in Stanford until last month. So Thomas, tell us about your lab and your work here in Zurich. Yeah, thanks for um, for having me today. Um, just switching over uh, to the presentation. Yeah, here, here we go. Um, so the the Swiss fintech lab, as you mentioned, was founded already back in 2016. So um, we are uh, live with this program for quite quite a while, and. Um, that's uh, why I want to um, step into the topic uh, with trends in fintech, um, as we can see it for now as a first uh, topic for today, then deep dive into sustainable digital finance or sustainable fintech, however you term it, um, because as you mentioned, it has two meanings. Uh, one is uh, it should last for a, for a while. The other one is really on sustainability and digital finance, the combination. And a third, um, why Switzerland is one of the hotspots for the fintech topic. So let's go into the, the first one. Um, 
fintech is evolving um, into all financial domains, um, which includes payments, investments, financing, and just recently, especially also reg tech and insure tech. Um, if you look at the numbers at, at the moment, fintech revenues are forecasted to triple in the in the next 10 years, depending on uh, whom you talk to. Um, and they are expected to reach approximately 500 billion US dollars in revenue in that time. So from a financial perspective, if you especially look at the first quarter in this year, uh, we had 67 fintech unicorns that are valued uh, at an ag 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 aggregate at approximately 250 billion US dollars, which is quite, quite a lot and quite impressive. Um, and uh, there were only three new unicorns added in the first quarter. Um, uh, these are Pine Labs, which is an Indian merchant platform uh, that primarily provides financing and last mile retail transaction technology. The second one is Flywire, a payments platform which is focusing on the vertical in, in, in the industry's payment. Um, and uh, the last one is High Radius, which uh, offers AI software for receivables and treasury. So what are the relevant areas of, of the future as we can see it right now as from these perspectives? Well, in the payments domain, um, I would say um, what especially is hot at the moment is uh, all kind of digital currencies and especially central bank digital currencies, um, which are currently evaluated from various central banks around the world, um, most recently announced by uh, the Central Bank of Japan, uh, but also uh, the Bank of International Settlements in Basel. Uh, who experiments with, with, with that. Then second, uh, in the investments domain, I would say um, everything which is around smart digital assets, um, which are currently being developed, they are in a more uh, not so mat mat mature stage, I would say. Uh, companies in that area like uh, the Swiss-based Six uh, Digital Exchange, or Taura, um, which allows small firms to issue their stocks in a very convenient way, which not necessarily does uh, re require any kind of stock exchange. Um, and lastly, financing, uh, where we saw a lot of crowdfinancing over the past years, I would say this is very also much coupled with the domain of blockchain and smart assets. And I expect to see also many innovations in that field too. So a uh, third um, and very much currently emerging trend is the use of FinTech uh, really very much coupled and connected with all forms of sustainability to increase uh, social, economic and environmental conditions. And I want to deep dive into that topic as well because we just recently worked on that in Stanford. And I think it's a very interesting topic as everyone is currently talking about it. Um, so. The, um, uh, as, as we can see it now at the moment, um, the improved digitization, which is taking place through FinTech across all financial service domains, um, FinTech um, becomes part um, uh, of, of, uh, um, of so-called digital financial ecosystems. So, it is not only the, the financial system which is coupled to that sector, uh, to, to, to sustainability, but also to, to other areas like uh, agricultural supply chains and, and the like. So the financial sector is one of the key pillars of sustainability across all in, in, in industries. Um, and you have various innovative examples ranging from digital supply chains um, in fashion and also in agricultural supply chains, as I mentioned before. Um, there are also examples around uh, from digital currency fuel smart meters for schools in Africa, digital investment marketplaces for forest tokens to crowdfunding enabled entrepreneurship in Asia and South, 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 South America. So digital in innovation in that term in financial services is changing the way 
how financial resources can be accessed, they can how they can be distributed, and how they can be managed. And thus, we we believe it can have an enormous in, impact um, on uh, the in, in, environment and also on on social conditions in various in, industries. One example. Um, which is very prominent at the moment is the task force on climate related financial disclosures from the financial stability board um, which aims at reducing investment at banks and insurers in carbon related companies um, uh, there is the sustainable digital finance fast task force from the united nations um, and um, we just uh, created also, which is another in, in initiative, a new, uh, or we work on a new global center for sustainable digital finance, which is a, a cooperation from Stanford University and University of Zurich. And the link you can see it in the slides is also provided here. Um, we were working on a, on a first white paper, uh, doing some first re re research on it, and we'll pro provide an innovation platform for that too. So sustainability in the fintech can also mean that it not only uh, pro provides long-term business models and uh, um, and things like that, but it can also mean the, the connection of sustainability and fintech. So the potentials uh, that fintech provides for uh, sustainability. And uh, last but not least, uh, why do we believe um, Switzerland is one of the hotspots for fintech? Well, uh, you also read about it in the in the news. Switzerland is the Europe number one in innovation champion still, and it's also still the, the number one wealth management financial center in in the world. So everything that has to do with wealth management and innovation um, should should be here. So uh, wealth tech uh, is one of the uh, prominent uh, topics there. So the combination of innovation tech technology and, and wealth management where Switzerland is very strong. Um, but it, there is also um, a very strong FinTech uh, and blockchain hub in general. So uh, more than 360 FinTech startups in the region, two thirds of them, as we heard in the greater Zurich area, a lot of companies were founded in, in the last 10 years and especially the uh, Crypto Valley, which uh, comes from Zoop to Zurich to to other areas um, in Switzerland, is very pro prominent all all around the world. And uh, we we believe uh, that the combination of the strengths of Switzerland, uh, re reliability, security, and all these things combined with the in 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 innovativeness is a very strong enabler for future models here. Because it has a very well regulated financial services uh, domain, um, including also, um, and I did this deregulation in, in brackets, uh, because just recently uh, the Swiss Federal Council also announced that they made huge steps towards a new blockchain framework for Switzerland. Um, also including some, some new fintech regulations which uh, really paved the way for new business uh, here in Switzerland. And so I, 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 I would really say Switzerland is one of the hotspots for the fintech topic in Europe and also in the, in, in the, in the world. And lastly, I want to mention, um, especially for uh, the collaboration between Korea and Switzerland, there is an innovation agreement uh, which allows uh, even funding of science-based innovation uh, from uh, national aid agencies, uh, the Korea Institute for Advancement of Technology, KIAT, and InnoSwiss in Switzerland, uh, which really allows uh, tight collaboration between the two countries that was signed already a, um, a few years ago. Um, so we are very keen to, to look forward to have new collaborations uh, in the future, also with um, Korean companies and ac ac academic in in institutions there. Um, so yeah, yeah, that was uh, or that were my three points. Um, so um, thank you very much for that opportunity for having me in this webinar, and uh, look also forward to the questions. 
um, I want to hand over now to the second speaker. Uh, if I may interfere shortly <laughs> first. Uh, sure. um, we'll hear about regulation later. And uh, by the way, this uh, bilateral innovation agreement between Kiat and InnoSwiss is an achievement or was signed 2014, I believe, under yes. the former President Park. And we still appreciate her very much for that specific thing. Right. I find one, one thing very interesting that you said, namely that fintech is not only about payments, crowdfunding, the more obvious functions or currency exchange. It's also about um, enabling or getting emerged in into ecosystems such as agriculture. Mm -hmm. Do yeah. you see a major growth path there, a possibility to get immersed more into these various ecosystems, enabling them? Mm -hmm. um, there, there, there is one prerequisite which is really very important for, for that, uh, which is the so-called open banking inter interfaces. So, so in the European Union, for example, the banks were really forced by the regulator to open up their interfaces so that other companies like the, the big tech companies and also the, the fintech startups could uh, uh, could exchange uh, data with the, with the banks on a more convenient way. And this will also, I think, take place in other or two other sectors. Um, so if you think, for example, the whole um, domain of uh, supply chain financing, um, where currently many uh, collaborations also evolve from various banks around the world, but also with, with other institutions from the logistics domain. I think uh, this is one of the obvious uh, fields where we can see in, in, in innovation in the next years. Um, so I really believe uh, that uh, the financial services sector by itself is not only um, uh, innovated uh, as, a, as, a, as a financial domain or, or, or as a sector by itself, but it will also lead to many innovations with other industries, which finally leads to these cross uh, industry uh, to digital ecosystems. And uh, another important enabler, I think, besides the, the open banking interfaces is a, a digital ID, because if you are able to authenticate a person uh, or a company, um, then it's much e easier also to, to do business across various industries, um, not only in the, in the financial services. Uh, if, if you have these two components, then I think um, we will see much more you know, innovation there. And it will be much more in contrast to what we see at the moment uh, with the big tech companies that have a very plat platform centric approach, uh, aggregating and centralizing all these uh, services on their platforms. I think when we will see the move to the web 2.0 or 3.0, however you will term it, which will uh, work in a more decentralized mode uh, based on blockchain technologies. So then you can really uh, bundle various services from various uh, players um, if you have a digital ID, ID and these uh, open inter interfaces. So it's very maybe, much maybe. a topic for the future. Maybe specifically in agriculture that you mentioned. Well, what does fintech mean in agriculture? Could you explain a little? Is it about uh, prices, informing the farmers, or can they negotiate to sell their produce mm -hmm. to the most uh, bitter? I think it goes all along the, the value chain, and it really starts with the, with the farmers who will be able to more uh, to to improve their their funding capabilities. There, um, they will also, um, if you go more down to the to the value chain to the consumers on the other end, then uh, for example, you will be able to really um, see where this product comes comes from. Um, will be able to see uh, what ingredients it, it has. So I think it will allow uh, track and trace. It will allow easier financing of opportunities. Uh, so there are a lot of potentials there. Another question would uh, be if regulation plays a role in these applications as well. 
Uh, actually, when um, designing this webinar, a colleague of mine said, why do you insist on regulation? Uh, there are many applications where it's not relevant. But I somehow feel regulation is important in any sector. Maybe, uh, Roni, could you already comment on that a little? The importance of regulation in, in uh, specific ecosystems applications of fintech? Um, yes, of course. I mean, as you correctly pointed out, regulation is something important, especially to make sure that there is a, an equal um, right of information, but also to make sure that not the consumers at the end will be at financial risk, at the counterparty risk of certain participants in the ecosystem. And I think therefore regulation is very useful to make sure that projects will be set up in an appropriate way also to um, have a certain protection in, in the ecosystem. So we do need regulation, but as little as possible, probably. Um, I think regulation is, is here to like create the rules, how you can play, but it should be here to foster um, the evolvement of technology and it should not be here to hinder technology. So I think it's, it's quite difficult to have appropriate regulation, especially that is technology neutral. But at the end, we need to have regulation as there will be too many people out with, with also bad intention, unfortunately. As little as possible, as much as necessary, right? Yeah. Okay. Um... Now, do we have questions from the audience to Thomas or regarding the topics we touched upon? Not at this stage. So uh, then uh, let's hear a Korean perspective. Uh, Jung Yoo Shin, he's the chairman of FinTech Center Korea. He's also a professor at Sogang University in Seoul and the dean of the Graduate School in Management of Technology, MOT. Previously to his current positions, he held important positions at Standard Chartered in Korea, Shinhan Investment, the large Korean bank, and Korea Venture Investment Corporation. Yu Shin, please. Thank you. Uh, Hi everybody, I'm Yu Shin Jung, uh, head of FinTech uh, Center Korea under FSCK, the Korean finance government, uh, set up to boost up uh, Korean uh, FinTech industry in Korea. Uh, today I'm uh, talk about you know, uh, Korean FinTech briefly. Uh, Korean FinTech has started a little later uh, than global market. However, because of a strong point in IP and government active uh, FinTech policy, I think uh, we have to actually catch up now. First, the banking sector, you can see uh, you know, the uh, left side of the graph. Uh, simple permanent uh, remittance is growing fast. Even though a simple payment uh, still about a 3% of uh, uh, total amount of credit card payment, uh, but uh, it's more than uh, triple in the uh, last three years. But here you see those four uh, uh, big uh, uh, pay uh, company, a uh, simple big company, uh, Samsung, uh, Kakao Pay, uh, Naval uh, Pay and Post Pay. Uh, particularly among them, Kakao Pay and the Naval Pay, which has its own platform, Vista platform, uh, the grow very fast recently. Right side of the slide, three neo banks have been uh, approved in Korea. Among them, Kakao Bank shows distinct growth. It, uh, it accumulated uh, 4.35 million non face to face accounts within 100 days after start of service. Uh, which astonished uh, people working in banks at the time, uh, 2017, and it turned to uh, uh, surplus in two years. We are saying it has a show uh, that in a catfish uh, effect. About P2P loan, I think uh, personally P2P loan is a very good business model, but right now, uh, Korean government concerned much because real estate uh, related loans P2P loans are too high portion, 80% uh, of total P2P lending in uh, last year. Right side of the graph, uh, in capital market sector, let me talk about the robot advisor, 
and crowdfunding. RoboAdvice has not got much public interest, but recently because of non-face-to-face digitization caused by COVID-19 and because of big loss in some representative Korean funds, Korean people increasingly start to use RoboAdvice uh, Robo accounts instead of a traditional fund by active asset management, making a Korean asset management a circle very nervous at this moment. Crowdfunding is one of funding vehicles of startups. Uh, unlike Enzel investment or venture capital, so many investors participate in a crowdfunding investment. So it has not only the uh, advantage of funding effect, I think, but also revenue generating and the uh, advertising effects as well. Uh, in 1917, uh, it has just uh, 5 million US dollars, but it became to uh, 260 million US dollars in last year, meaning five times increase in three years. Personally, I think uh, if crowdfunding and e-commerce platform is linked, I think it becomes a very good uh, convergent business model. Uh, right side of the graph, uh, lastly, uh, initial tech started late. Um, but as in the global market, interest and investment uh, about initial tech in Korea is gradually uh, growing. Then, where is Korean fintech industry located? I think there are four stages for fintech innovation. Four stages unbundling. The consumer choose best customer satisfying uh, services each in, a, in uh, their hand. Uh, the second stage is digital platform. Maybe I think a toss. TOS is the first unicorn fintech in Korea, is a good example. At first, they provide only a uh, limited service. But according as they get customers' loyalty, they start to provide many services as well, including payment, securities, insurance, even recently, uh, including nail bank. The third stage is very important in that it is to converge with infrastructure technology such as ABCD. AI, blockchain, cloud computing, and this data. Uh, because uh, we can use big data uh, in this uh, third stage, technology such as AI uh, becomes very, very uh, important. Therefore, so called tech pin, I think, you know, uh, Professor Putman uh, said, I think it is, you know, the uh, fintech enabler. Uh, so, for tech pin features, fintech companies more focused on technology. Uh, emerges in this stage. Uh, January this year, the Korean National Assembly passed the amended three major data acts. So, in that sense, Korea now entered the third step of fintech innovation. I'll talk more about uh, this about this. And the last stage, financial services can be integrated with non-financial services. Uh, we talk about you know the, the finance and the, you know agriculture, right? Many other you know the industries. So we can see big tech companies such as Bafa in USA, and Batman in China. I call Batman the AT man. Uh, as you see, financial settlement data has all information for analyzing consumers' behaviors. Therefore, utilizing that data can make a business model, including both financial and non-financial sectors. That is the full last stage. One of the reasons of rapid growth of uh, fintech in Korea as I think a government's uh, active policy on fintech. The Korean National Assembly passed a legislation called the Financial Innovation Support Act uh, in the end of uh, 2018. Based on this act, two things, regulatory sandbox and open banking came into force. So for six commercial bank and 20 fintech companies have signed up for opening bank. We call it round one, opening bank. We are, you know, expect to have in you know, a round two. Next one is a uh, sandbox regulatory. The company is granted with a temporal approval for innovative services. Total 102 of innovative financial services have been designated for last one year. It explained 40 percentage of all industries innovative services in Korea. So it is a very uh, high rate. It, you know, the, uh, comes from uh, financial sector. It is uh, amazing. And just before I explain, uh, the Korean National Assembly passed data related acts. And so Korea started the data economy. In order to support it, 
financial government, FSCK, open the data exchange platform before any other Ministry of Korea government uh, last May. It handled not only financial data, but also distribution and the tele uh, telecommunication data as well. And um, uh, lastly, let me talk about my data. Uh, I think you know you have you know the the, the Udly, uh, very famous you know the, the my data uh, company in Switzerland. Mm. Uh, Korean government will announce my data guideline on uh, coming August and designate my data providers in October. Uh, at this moment, my data is the most hot area in Korea. In the survey, 116 companies hope to be my data companies. Amazing thing is that it includes not only traditional financial companies, but fintech company and especially 41 non-financial companies, including very big companies like LG, SK, KT, Naval, etc. So uh, we are uh, to expect uh, more uh, surprising coming. Last one. Go global fintech market through uh, financial market through fintech. So I, ha I have uh, some minor questions for, uh, from uh, Korean fintech companies. Uh, do you have a regulation uh, sandbox in EU, EU uh, Switzerland? And um, some people want to uh, uh, European tax structure. Uh, what tax structure you know the, the, the best, particularly when they uh, set up the you know the holding company in uh, Switzerland or EU? And um, what kind of uh, you know the business model or uh, uh, fintech or financial technology uh, has strong demand in uh, Switzerland and uh, in EU? So I think you know the uh, uh, who are the uh, who are interested in uh, go global and uh, you know to enter a European market through you know the Switzerland. I think uh, you know the when hear voices from uh, Korean printing industry, I find uh, simple payment and the simple remittance and tech pin. Uh, in other words, pin uh, tech enabler. They are you know the interest in that. That's, That's a term that. That's a term that I learned from you, actually, when we talked before uh, the webinar, tech fin. We talk of fintech and tech fin is exactly the enabling technology for specific industry sectors like agriculture, like, like uh, machine industry, whatever. Has anybody of the speakers heard this uh, term before, tech fin? <laughs> it is the only, you know, the used in uh, uh, Korea, but I think uh, fintech, uh, more focusing on technology. So, so we can learn from you. That's great. Uh, <laughs> Yushin, listening to you, uh, the, the first uh, part of the presentation, I had the feeling that uh, the Korean government has also moved. They created a sandbox principle. It is quite have my data platform. It, it uh, sounded quite self-sufficient as if Korean fintech did not need really uh, European markets or anything. Then your last, your last slide somehow saved uh, <laughs> the topic here by proposing that have, we should you know, globalize. <laughs> Can you, could you comment on that a little? Uh, because you know, the uh, uh, end of uh, November last year, the FSDK and you know, the, our center released uh, the, the announcement uh, about you know, the scaling up strategy uh, for fintech which means uh, you know the, the, we need uh, you know the investment and we need to go uh, the broader market of course we can uh, you know the broad uh, you know the fintech market in, uh, in a domestic market but uh, definitely we need you know to go global so go europe go switzerland so i um, you know the uh, switzerland is uh, you know number one uh, innovation uh, center and then uh, a fintech hub so um, we can, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, go to uh, you know Europe or through uh, the Switzerland, right? So fintech center, I'm in charge. Uh, in charge of is a kind of you know the uh, organization boost up Korean fintech industry. So we can uh, share information, legislation, regulation, and the market practice so on, and so um, uh, we can help uh, the uh, uh, fintech companies or, or financial uh, companies, you know, the host country. I'm glad to hear that. So let me ask uh, Thomas, for example, uh, what do Korean, what criteria do Korean companies have to fulfill 
in order to collaborate, for instance, with your Swiss FinTech Innovation Lab or on a broader scale with InnoSwiss uh, to set up actual projects and uh, take a foothold in Europe? What does it take from the Korean side to succeed in Europe? So I think, you know, even though we use, you know, webinar online, but uh, in some cases we need, you know, the face-to-face uh, -face, uh, meeting and, uh, you know, the, the contact. So uh, if, you know, the, uh, we, uh, we uh, can overcome <laughs> the, the uh, COVID-19, uh, because we have, you know, the, the, uh, even though it is not global, but big, you know, the uh, financial institution, uh, bank and, uh, you know, some insurance company. So um, uh, we can uh, utilize the uh, we, uh, we can need help of uh, you know the, the, the Korean uh, bank or insurance companies or uh, security firm located in uh, in Swiss uh, uh, Europe and then because we already have uh, experience uh, in uh, Southeast Asia Jakarta and Hanoi uh, Korean bank you know that has uh, you know the, uh, uh, established you know the uh, fintech lab uh, not only for uh, you know the Korean uh, fintech but you know the local companies as well so. Uh, we can uh, use that and um, you know that we can help with each other in Switzerland. Thomas, any any thoughts about collaboration? Yeah, I think it's quite in interesting because um, for the Korean companies to go into the European market and also for the Swiss companies to uh, extend their business to the Asian market, as you said, um, also other uh, countries that are that you're working with, I would say this is a great opportunity, especially what you mentioned with the InnoSwiss program and the Kiat collaboration, uh, where we can really set up something. And I absolutely agree uh, that face-to-face -face still is very important. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so um, uh, it, it really depends a little bit on, on each individual case. I would say, um, for example, peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending is uh, maybe except for a few European countries, it's not so much a case here in Europe than it is in, in, in many Asian countries. On the other side, uh, we have many financial in, in, institutions here, large banks uh, that are active in wealth management, but also retail banking. Um, so uh, B2B fintechs are very prominent here. Uh, so it really depends on, on which company you are look, look, looking at, but there are many op opportunities on this axis uh, from Asia to, to, to Europe where we can collaborate uh, in, in, in various fields. Thank you. I don't see any questions from the audience here, Michael. Correct. There is so far no questions, so please uh, don't be shy. Raise your questions in the chat box. Uh, we have very knowledgeable speakers, and uh, we would be pleased to answer your questions. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I mean we are at a slight advantage here. We talked about these issues before, and now we are uh, discussing. But uh, don't shy away from seemingly simple questions because they're usually the most important ones, right? <laughs> Very true. Okay, so um, regarding uh, regulations, there usually are a lot of questions. Um, maybe I can just put one before even uh, Ronnie is speaking. One question that always comes up when I'm in Korea uh, talking with, with uh, companies is how is it when I'm in Switzerland? Can I provide my fintech services in the European Union as well? For instance, uh, currency exchange, uh, um, a platform such as TransferWise, which is in London, I believe, originally from Estonia, um, they change money. Can a Korean money changer also operate in the European Union if they have a Swiss operation, Swiss company present here? Or do they have to be in the EU to have full access? I think um, uh, we have a, a maybe that's a question for for the Swiss. Do you, do you have the answer? Then you're a genius. I, <laughs> no, no, I no. haven't been able to find out so far. Maybe we let Ronnie speak first. Yeah. So um, as Switzerland is not part of the European Economic Area, it also means that you cannot just cross border and um, get into other markets. 
which however does not mean that um, reverse solicitation is not possible. So if people from BU directly get in touch with you, depending of course on the service, in most cases you are allowed to offer the services. Um, but going from Switzerland then into the EU is usually not that a big step because um, Swiss laws are different, but they are in most cases some kind of aligned with the European Union laws. And also from a language perspective, it's, it's usually not a big thing then for a Swiss company to get into the EU market. So that's in short the answer to the question. Thank you, Ronnie. That leads us directly to your uh, proper presentation, actually. Uh, Ronald Kogens, Ronnie for us, he's a lawyer at the Froreap Law Firms, which has offices in Switzerland, various, but also in London and Madrid. It's an international law firm. And uh, Froreap, to be transparent, is also a sponsor of our company, Greater Zurich Area AG, which is a public private organization. We are supported by nine states or provinces and uh, about 30 private companies and Froreap is one of them. So Ronnie has and his team have handled over 50 fintech projects over the past years and he's guiding uh, fintech companies through the compliance process with FINMA with our uh, financial markets regulator. He specializes of course not not mainly in the traditional uh, financial services but in new and disruptive technologies he accompanies uh, such fintech companies through the, through the whole life cycle from the formation, establishment of the company to the structuring of the product or service uh, and including the fundraising on the way to, to growth, to success, to scale up uh, until the actually uh, going public in some cases. So none more competent than Ronnie to introduce us to Switzerland's regulatory landscape. Thank you very much, Mark. So um, in my presentation, I would like to give a brief overview of the regulatory landscape in Switzerland, in particular focusing on um, FinTech. So first I would like to start with um, the regulation and authorities. So um, as already mentioned, uh, Swiss financial market laws is, is regulated on a federal level, which means all over Switzerland, there is just one financial market law, there are no local differences, which also makes it uh, much easier to start with a project. Um, Swiss laws are not similar as European laws. They sometimes differ a little bit, but as I said before, they are some kind of aligned. But I see this as a, a benefit because Switzerland is much faster in adjusting laws if they see a need to um, provide new technologies some boost whereas if you compare to the European Union it takes much longer until all countries agree on a um, European level and then also implement it on a local national level which makes it much more complicated to start as a fintech. Um, the Swiss financial market is supervised by the Swiss Financial Market Supervisory Authority, also known as FINMA. FINMA has the competence to supervise all parts of the financial market, which means that there is no conflict of competences, as you may have heard, for example, in the US, where the Exchange Trading Commission has a different opinion on a technology than the Securities Trade Commission, which then also hinders the development of technology. And here in Switzerland, we have one single authority and the authority has the full competence to decide on how technology will be treated under financial market laws. Um, FINMA also have a dedicated FinTech desk with um, specialists that have um, a deep understanding of regulation, of course, but also on technology. So you can talk to them and you um, can go into the details of your technology. They also want to know the details and then you can get into a back and forth and figure out on how in the best way you can move forward with your project. Um, the cool thing with the FinTech desk and generally FINMA is you have always the opportunity to bring your project on paper 
with a detailed description. And then FINMA will do a pre-analysis and in case they agree with your assumptions, they will also issue a non-action letter. Um, such non-action letter, um, depending of course on, on the project, but if it's something that FINMA has already seen before, it can be expected within um, three to four weeks. If it's a larger project or something completely new, then it can take up to six months. But the good thing is with a non-action letter from FINMA, you have full clearance. It makes it also much easier then to collaborate with, for example, exchanges in Switzerland, but also other countries or with banks, because you have basically an approval of FINMA that your project will not end up in a regulatory enforcement action. Of course, as long as you do it as you as you described in in the submission. So non-action um, in this case is something positive, right? Non-action usually in business life is bad, but here it's good. You're yeah, free to no, act. Non-action means the regulator is confirming that when you roll out your fintech project, Finma will not take any enforcement actions against your activity, which is very positive because otherwise you always have to be scared of, especially with new and disruptive technologies that you some kinds of digging into financial market laws without knowing it. Um, so FinTech in Switzerland, as also Thomas mentioned before, we have specific areas. Recent years, there was a strong focus on DLT and blockchain projects. And um, there are all kinds of projects, so we had ecosystem projects like Ethereum, Tezos, Ripple, Cardano, but also um, decentralized web projects like Polkadot. We had a lot of token sales with securities, tokenization of shares, of participation rights. Actually, we also had a quite interesting case in terms of agriculture where um, a cattle ranch has been tokenized, which means that the investors participate in the sale of meat from the cattle ranch and everything has put, been put on the blockchain and digitized so that the investors always see the state of the cattle and the growth of the cattle and then they also receive the participation payments by means of a of, of te technology solution instead of going through a traditional bank. Um, in Switzerland, the regulatory landscape is quite clear in terms of blockchain and DLT. So FINMA already issued a guidance on the qualification of tokens in um, 2018, where they dis distinguish between payment utility and security tokens. So for issuing issuance of tokens, it, it's quite clear on how they will qualify under financial market laws. Then FINMA also issued a second guidance specifically on stablecoin where they publicly outlined on how they will treat stablecoins if they are backed by um, metals or fiat money or whatever. And by this, it helps very much um, people to build up their startup from the beginning in a way that is compliant with applicable financial market laws. And of course, the stablecoin guidance was also. Um, part of, of Libra Association coming to Switzerland as also Libra um, decided to, to, or choose Switzerland because of, of the regulation. Then next to DLT we also have a neo banking and payment solution projects and I think there is a strong movement and also a strong need for payment solutions as the traditional Swiss banks started moving now, but have not provided much of innovation in this regard. So that's why also companies like Transferwise or Revolut started also very successful in offering their services into Switzerland. And I think there, there is a lot of potential, um, not only directly in the banking sector, but also in the consumer industry, for example, for merchants, because in Switzerland, a lot of merchants still pay quite high fees if they accept card payments. And there could be a quite interesting solution by using um, tech to have lower fees, but also to connect customers more closely to merchants. 
Um, so, for example, in this regard, we, we helped the um, um, real estate um, company from Dubai MR in tokenizing and bringing their loyalty system to the blockchain, where they try to create a closer interaction between their clients and the different um, entities that they have in their holding structure. Um, for um, neo banking solutions and also payment solutions, Switzerland has specific um, promotion of innovation. So Switzerland introduced two years ago the Sandbox solution, which means that no banking license for payment systems is required up to accepting funds of 1 million or per person less than 3,000 Swiss francs. And when you have tested your project and believe that it works and you want to go above the 1 million, Switzerland also has a specific fintech banking license light, which um, is not comparable to a full banking license as there is less of organizational requirements and regulatory requirements, but you already start a little bit of building it up and then you can accept funds of up to 100 million Swiss francs. And if you start with a FinTech license, banking license light license, it also makes it a much easier to take the step than into becoming a full bank if your um, FinTech business is fully flourishing. Then, as also mentioned before by Thomas, crowdfunding is also a topic in Switzerland. There, there is also specific regulation that says that as a crowdfunding service provider, you can accept money from the um, crowd investors and keep it for up to 60 days without becoming a bank, which is also very helpful as otherwise as crowdfunding provider, you would not offer these services if you need a banking license. Then um, last but not least, other aspects of Switzerland is of course, um, the laws are in, if possible, technology neutral. The authorities are familiar with technology. It's not only FINMA, it's also the tax authorities. So also the tax authorities published guidance two years ago. You can also um, submit a tax ruling to the tax authorities, where, for example, if you have cross-border revenues or cross-border payments in a FinTech project, they provide you with a confirmation that they agree on the tax qualification, which then is binding for them, but also a very good tool for you as you have certainty on um, how the taxation will work. And by this, you can build up a structure which you know it will work also in two or three years. Um, on the other side, Switzerland is also constantly um, adjusting the laws for the benefit of technology. And what I really appreciated is that Switzerland has not just introduced a completely new law, because I am the opinion that introducing a new law that has hundreds of new articles is very challenging because there are no precedents, so no one knows on how actually it has to be applied. So Switzerland choose another way they just looked at all laws, for example, in terms of um, distributed ledger technology, and then figured out where there can be or must be adjustments to bring out the best of the technology. And Switzerland started this process in 2017, and they completed the process. Now um, the adjustments have been proposed, have also been accepted by the parliament, and um, pretty soon Switzerland will have a slightly adjusted laws, which um, like take away the last potential uncertainties on how DLT and digital assets will be qualified on the Swiss law, which then is very helpful to boost the space of, of DLT and digital assets also into the traditional financing sector. Um, Lastly, but not least, now Switzerland, as also pointed out by Thomas, has a, a quite interesting ecosystem. Um, Switzerland is not just an offshore jurisdiction where people have PO box companies but no stuff on the ground. Switzerland has service providers. We have 
the ecosystem here around Zurich with the Crypto Valley in Zug and Zurich, with uh, different fintech hubs, also co-working spaces. Um, in addition to that, of course, we also have uh, strong global players in the old-fashioned financial market, which also could be very interesting for fintech companies to start collaborating together and also get, by the help of them, into other global markets and then spreading out into the world. So this was my short presentation of the fintech landscape. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Also, the speakers can ask questions if there are any. Nonia, we don't hear you. Yeah. Yep. Good. Yeah. Nonia, you say about you know the uh, uh, sandbox solution is how is different from uh, regulatory sandbox? Same or similar or different? Um, so you mean compared to to which one? To the one in in South Korea or? South Korea, you know, mimicking on the 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 uh, the sandbox in uh, uh, England. So, um, I think that you understand yeah, that. many countries have a sandbox. Uh, in Switzerland, it's really up to one million. And I think what is new was was changed. I think uh, this year is that you can even pay interest on on the deposits that you get, but you cannot you cannot uh, do a spread business like a interest rate differentiation business with it. You cannot speculate. It's it's ultimately it's all about protecting the public and making very clear which risks are being taken by investing, for instance, in a startup that operates with a sandbox or operates with a banking license right, uh, light. Do I see? Do I say this correctly, Ronnie? Yes, that's correct. And I think that the one million should really be seen as a playground where you basically can just do whatever you want. And after one million, then you have to go one step further and then into the fintech license light. And I think 100 million is, is quite an, an interesting amount, especially if you want to do something um, in, in the area of payment solutions or neo banking. Um, as, as Mark mentioned, comparing with other countries is quite difficult because it's not one to one the same and the whole regulatory landscape is built up differently. So that's why it's difficult for me to give you a comparison exactly now to the UK. Which is why you need to hire a lawyer. I'm not advertising specifically for Ori, but it could of course be for Ori. Uh, no, it's really from, from uh, project experience. Uh, Indian companies or Chinese or whoever thinks, oh, we can do that ourselves. We just, it was back in, in 2017 when there's kind of a gold rush or crypto rush, ICO rush. Uh, also, we had two Korean ICOs in 2017, which later ran into problems. Uh, that's not the case anymore. You really need to comply with the FINMA regulation. You need a, a very savvy, knowledgeable guidance uh, through that. And it has a cost, of course. It's uh, certainly um, a five-digit uh, figure in dollars or Swiss francs that you, you must be ready to spend for the whole compliance process, right? Yeah, I mean, and as I said, not, not to make promotion for myself, but I think it makes sense also to get in touch with lawyers as early as possible because we are also trying to help to give you initial indications on how you can structure the project that you will dig as less as possible into regulation, but also to bring out the best of your technology. And sometimes it's really just about fine tuning. Um, a little bit within your your intention within your project and then you will have it much easier to launch than you, with your project in switzerland but also in most cases in other countries because if if a swiss lawyer like ronnie has seen 50 projects business projects actual cases he, he develops a business understanding and can advise right from the beginning and there are also other specialized advisory firms for blockchain enterprises and then then you know zurich is a very international location where you find uh, you can have a, an issue with hedge funds or family offices 
you will find specialized lawyers for everything or specialized experts in logistics, whatever you name it, maybe not as many as New York or London, but uh, certainly uh, a little less expensive and also very capable. We are coming to an end closely. Would anybody of the speakers like to have a last comment or question to each other's presentations or to the general discussion? I mean, there have been things we haven't been able to talk about, such as the incubator, accelerator programs, kickstart innovation, F10, which is supported by the Swiss Stock Exchange 6. There are many possibilities where you can enter uh, the ecosystem of fintech or financial services and other industry sectors in Switzerland, the Zurich region. So let's uh, not have the end of it here. We, uh, I think you find our website, uh, our um, email addresses on our website or on the invitation that you got. And I must also mention our representative in Korea, John Kim, who uh, for an unexpected reason could not join the webinar today, but is uh, available 24 7 in in seoul for questions uh yushin knows him well and uh yes uh maybe i can show one last slide myself if you allow milena if you give me some power on that because it's kind of uh, this one <laughs> <laughs> I mean that, was, faces. <laughs> <laughs> that was back in when was it 17 when we signed an mou actually and now we've uh, finally done something together thank you milena okay <laughs> so let let me thank very much the the speakers thomas pushman from university zurich Dong Yoshin from Sogang University and Fintech Center Korea, Ronnie Kogens from Florip Lawyers, and uh, the audience uh, which has stayed with us steadily throughout the webinar. If you have questions after the webinar, as I said, contact us. And uh, yes, I hope uh, it has been useful. I've learned a lot. And I would like to thank also uh, my colleagues and the technical team which enables all this. So it's goodbye from uh, Michael, from Milena, and it's goodbye from me. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. See you. <laughs>